like. So if there's one that that you're like, oh, I, yeah, that's a good question, upvote for it, and then that'll make sure that I it gets my attention and I ask our panelists. Okay, uh, without further ado, then I will bring our uh, panelists onto the stage. All right, there we go. And uh, like I said, Bryn will be joining us shortly, um, but hopefully it won't take too long. Well, let's start uh, with you, Gab Gabriella. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your book, and if you could read an excerpt for us. For sure, absolutely. Well, uh, first of all, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Gabriella Saab. I am joining you today uh, from Mobile, Alabama. Uh, so I'm in the very deep south and uh, I am just so excited to be here and to talk about historical fiction with all of you and all these wonderful novels. I'm the author of The Last Checkmate. That was my debut novel that came out in October of 2021. And uh, my forthcoming novel is called Daughters of Victory that will be releasing in uh, just over a week on uh, the 24th of this month. So I'm really excited. And so excited to be here and tell y'all a little bit more about it. Uh, so this book is a dual timeline between the Russian Revolution and the World War II Soviet Union. It's about uh, two different women caught up in those times. They uh, are a grandmother and a granddaughter. And uh, it's basically about uh, these two people navigating uh, the struggles of family through the trials of war. And so both of these women are revolutionaries, they're resistance members, they're assassins, they're all sorts of things. Uh, so I'm going to read just a little bit uh, from the novel for you. So here's a picture of the cover so you can all see it. Uh, it's a dual timeline. So this point of view is my first character. Uh, she is the revolutionary. Her name is Svetlana. She's the grandmother of my World War II character. Uh, so the way I structured this novel is we begin the story in uh, kind of the end of Svetlana's timeline, and then you flash back to every, all the events that build up to that point. So it's a very pivotal moment uh, in her story, and that is where we start in chapter one. So without further ado, chapter one, Moscow, the 30th of August, 1918. All day I watched and I waited, consumed by one certainty. The fate of the revolution relied on me and the bullets inside my pistol. My grip on the gun remained steady, eyes trained on the crowd below, where throngs gathered before the Mikhailson Armaments Factory in South Moscow, spilled across the street, seeped into the small square. A hot summer breeze drifted through the open attic window. Its efforts to ruffle my hair and skirt were futile, lost in a battle against the sweat plastering them to my skin. Neither the heat nor the filth deterred me. I had not spent hours hiding in this abandoned building on Pavlovskaya Street for my efforts to come to nothing. Salvaging the revolution was never a matter of questioning my own ability. How could it be when my Browning and I never missed our target? It was a matter of waiting, waiting for him. Stillness settled over the crowd. The same quiet found me inside this squalid attic. Perhaps the multitudes below sensed something monumental was coming. We were united, reverent silence tinged with anticipation, though I imagined our expectations vastly differed. He condemned democracy for favoring capitalists and the bourgeoisie. Though such claims held truth, he had blinded the working people by promising to free them from a government that had suppressed them. Did they not see that his party too would enslave them beneath its oppression as imperialism had? I saw it, understood where it led. The people had already overthrown the czar and rightly so. Now it was up to me to prevent a new dictatorship before it began. So I will stop there. And that is just a little tiny taste of her and her, uh, just a little teaser of her political affiliations and uh, the work she feels is hers to do uh, within the revolution. Yeah, I think that's a great way to set up the history there. You know, it's, <laughs> it's such inner personal thought um, but bringing up some really important points about that moment in history. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, let's uh, bring Peter on, author of Picture in the Sand. If you could tell us about yourself, your book, and, and read an excerpt for us. Sure. Thank you very much for having me on, Colin. Uh, very much looking forward to this. Um, I've done a lot of different things in my life. I was a journalist in New York City. I've written for a bunch of television shows that you might have heard of. And I've written eight other novels, uh, but most of those are crime novels, contemporary. So this is my first piece of historical uh, fiction. 
And it took me 20 years uh, to put it together. So this has been a, a big one for me. So let me just dive in to the excerpt uh, that I'm going to read and then back out a little bit and tell you what the book is about. The book begins with a prologue and there are emails in the prologue. And this is one of them. July 23rd, 2014. Dear Alex, I'm too old to call you by any other name. It has been more than six weeks since any of us have heard from you. Your mother cries every single day, often several times in the course of one meal. Occasionally, your two sisters cry as well, but mostly they just stay in their rooms. Your father is like a zombie. Since you haven't answered any of your parents' emails, I don't know if you're aware he left his job at the bank to devote himself full-time to searching for you. He has spoken to every taxi service, every airline, every State Department and embassy official who will take his phone calls. He flew to Cairo and Istanbul, showing your picture and spending thousands of dollars on fixers trying to track you down. It appears you slipped through the fence to Syria to join these so-called militants fighting under the black flag. When your father tried to follow your path, he was detained by the Syrian police, badly beaten, and then sent back to Turkey. Now he's home, and though your mother says she doesn't blame him for not finding you, they are not happy the way they used to be, which makes me very sad. There is no real reason for you to respond to me when you haven't responded to anyone else. Even though I've been part of your life since the moment you were born, you hardly know me. And I'm sure you would say I hardly know you, even though we've lived under the same roof since your grandmother died and your parents asked me to move in. You are a young man who says he is off to fight a battle for his people. I am an old man who owns a gas station, prays five times a day, roots for the New York Mets, cries at old movies, and misses his wife terribly. You have always played the dutiful, polite grandson around me. You have smiled at my tiresome jokes, pulled out the chair for me at the dinner table, and covered me with a blanket when I fall asleep snoring in front of the TV. You have shown me respect as the family elder, the father of your father, still working at the age of 85. You have always been patient and said the right things. But I know you have not been very much interested in me. And why should you be? Someone who has lived what seems to you such a dull, complacent life could understand nothing about the great heroic journey you have embarked upon. Except one thing you said in your letter to your mother caught my attention. You say this journey you have embarked upon is your destiny. You believe that something far back in the past, beyond your parents' comfortable lives, is calling out to you. I understand this better than you believe. When I was your age, I went on a similar journey and very nearly did not come back. It's a story that I've never told you. In fact, I've told very little of it to anyone in the United States since I came here more than 40 years ago. Even your father, my only child, knows just the broad outlines because I have always cut him off from asking too many questions. I wanted him to be an American, bright-eyed and hopeful, proud of me as his father, and knowing as little as possible about the past. Because the truth is that your boring grandfather, Ali Hassan, the gas station owner with his leathery skin, his old man cologne, and his corny jokes spent many years in prison for being a violent criminal and lost his left eye in the process. I've always been strict about keeping this secret, but after your grandmother died, I found myself starting to write things down. Why? I wasn't sure at first. But when I was a young man, I was a kind of writer, or at least I aspired to be. So I began to write my life story. 
not because I believed anyone would ever publish it, but because I recognized something of my own restlessness in you. So I wanted you to know me, to know that I had this life so there would be some record to pass on. For a while, I thought I might not show it to you, at least not while I was still alive. But now I feel more urgency to share it. I don't know if you will have the time or the inclination to read what I have attached here if God sees fit to have it reach you. But I hope you will, because I know how this movie ends. Yours, with love and compassion, Grandpa. So what follows is the kind of book within the book, the historic novel within the frame of a, the present day novel. And it tells the story of what happened to Ali, the grandfather, in the fall of 1954 in Egypt, when the most extravagant Bible epic in Hollywood history came to the country in the middle of a revolution. And Ali, then a young movie fan, got his dream job working for Cecil B. DeMille, the legendary director, on his last movie, The Ten Commandments. It turns into a journey of love and loss that takes Ali from the movie set with Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner to a real life assassination plot that changed the plot the course of history to prison and finally a chance for redemption. It's also about a moment in history when the United States and the Middle East had a kind of love affair that ended badly and how that moment still echoes in the present day. And finally, it's a dialogue between past and present, between grandfather and grandson, who wishes to understand that past and understand how his grandfather became the man that he is, and just as importantly, how he might become the man he aspires to be himself. Wow, thank you, Peter. I think that prologue definitely sets up the, the story um, and, and really shows um, how important it is to to look at history because you know the the email is more of a, a contemporary yeah. thing and it kind of shows how important it is to go back and look at how we got to where we are. Right, because I think the question, at least for me, in writing historic fiction, is why should people today care about it? And so how do you make it alive for people who've never heard of Cecil B. DeMille, never heard of Charlton Heston, never heard of Gamal Abdel Nasser? never heard of the Muslim Brotherhood, in fact, but all that sets the stage for 9-11 uh, very much in the world that we're living in today and conflicts that are still going on as of this afternoon. Yeah. Well, I want to get more into that, um, but let's go back to Gabriella. Um, first of all, though, I, I just want to apologize. Bryn Barno, is, she's working really hard. I'm trying to text with her. She restarted her router, so I'm not sure what's going on. Um, some technical difficulties there. Hopefully she can join us, um, but we'll keep uh, pressing on without her for now. Uh, so Gabriella, tell us more about your character Svetlana. I'm particularly interested in how the, histo the history between World War I and World War II relates to her character arc and how she changes throughout the story. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so the idea for this novel came first from uh, my research for The Last Checkmate. So as I was digging into World War II history, I actually discovered a young woman that inspired the Soviet character in Daughters of Victory. Uh, but I didn't want to do just World War II again. I wanted to tie something else to it. So I thought maybe I can find something uh, in Russian history that I could tie or Soviet history uh, to this idea for this World War II storyline I have. Uh, so I dug back, you know, 20, 30, 40 years earlier, just kind of picking around, seeing if anything interesting jumped out at me. And I discovered uh, two particular women who inspired the character of Svetlana. One is a woman named Fania Kaplan, who is actually in the novel as a secondary character. Um, she was in, uh, well, there's, there's debate on what political party she was in, if any of them. Some think uh, she was in the Socialist Revolutionary Party, which is the party that I feature uh, in this novel. Uh, so uh, what a lot of people and what I didn't realize was after the fall of the Romanovs, uh, there were all these different political factions kind of vying for control. Uh, so we had the Bolsheviks, we had the Mensheviks, socialist revolutionaries, and uh, some others. And so I really wanted to dig into uh, this character, Fania Kaplan, because I thought hers was a very fascinating story uh, just in her revolutionary life and uh, 
the things she did, I can't tell you too many of them because they're spoilers, but um, there's some debate on her. Uh, there's a lot of mystery around who she was. Um, so I thought she was a very interesting woman. And then uh, another woman was a, a few years earlier, a few years before that, so late 1800s, early 1900s, um, was a woman named Vera Finer, who was an aristocrat. And she left to join a group called the People's Will, which kind of evolved into what became the Socialist Revolutionary Party. And so Finer was arrested for political terrorism, imprisoned uh, for what was supposed to be life, and then was released uh, when the czar was overthrown. All those political prisoners were then pardoned and set free. Um, so Svetlana is kind of a composite of those two. She is the daughter of an aristocratic family who leaves uh, to join this revolution when she's a very young girl, just a teenager, um, and gets arrested uh, for that, sentenced to life imprisonment. And then, so that scene I read you is months after uh, the initial revolution is kind of in the thick of things. So she's initially arrested in uh, 1906 and is in prison until about 1917 when uh, the czar is overthrown and then all these prisoners are pardoned. So after this chapter I read you, we jump back to 1916 when she is being released from prison unexpectedly and doesn't know why, she doesn't know what's happened yet. Um, so she goes back to Moscow to join this revolution because now she feels this is finally what she's been waiting for, this opportunity to create this government uh, where there's more opportunity for everyone, more equality and all of these things because uh, the Socialist Revolutionary Party was very invested in uh, socialism and also a democratic structure of government. So they wanted uh, a say for everyone basically. And um, so it was very, very interesting to dive into that history and all these different parties and the ways they advocated for themselves and their beliefs, a lot of them I were very into political terrorism, propaganda, things like that. And it was just a very interesting time in Russian history that I didn't know a whole lot about. And so I wanted to explore that, explore what someone like her would have endured coming from this privileged life to this life with these people who have suffered so much more than she has under the old regime. Because for her, hers was a very comfortable life. And now she's come to join these people who have, you know, been peasants and in essentially you know enslaved to the government working for you know just a pittance of what they produce and things like that and so i thought it would just be a very interesting character arc to explore and then following the revolution and everything that happens uh where does her life take her how does she live with the choices she's made with the sacrifices she's made and the ultimate uh results of that revolution that she believed in so strongly well you, you talked about um not knowing about that that history and so it must have been mm -hmm. kind of enjoyable for you to to research it and get into it and find out more about it can you tell us a little bit about you know how you got interested in that history especially seeing that your other your the other novel you've published is related <laughs> to the same time period yes uh so actually both stories sort of found me uh for the last checkmate that stemmed from a general interest in World War II, I was always very fascinated by that time period and just how in the world did these kinds of things happen, you know? And specifically for the people at home, the resistance, all those people, because in school, you know, I'd learned a lot about the battles and the politics and those sorts of things that caused everything that we know happened. But I was very interested in uh, everyone else. You know, what were the people who were not on the front fighting doing? And what were the resistors doing? And what were the women and children doing? Um, so what led me to Eastern Europe was just that I didn't know as much about it. I read some historical fiction set in England or set in France about those people I was interested in, either resistance members or women in the workforce or whatever the case may be. But I had not learned much about Eastern Europe. So I thought, uh, let me dig around in Eastern Europe and see if I can find something interesting because um, one of my favorite saints was an Eastern European uh, Franciscan friar from Poland who was killed at Auschwitz. And so I wanted to kind of explore that side of the history a little bit more. And in doing that, discovered uh, this young Soviet partisan named uh, Zina Portnova, who was a resistance member who uh, poisoned Nazis. And she was the inspiration for my World War II character. Uh, so between, I just kind of tucked that little tidbit away for the future as I was researching The Last Checkmate and thought that'd be a really interesting story to explore. And then I came back to it uh, to develop Daughters of Victory. So it definitely just stemmed from a general interest in history and in this particular time period and the fact that Eastern Europe was not talked about as much as I would have liked it to be. 
Yeah, definitely. The Eastern Front isn't represented as much in historical books as, as Western Front and other parts of World War II. Well, Peter, let's go back to you. Um, you, you know, you already talked a lot about the history, so I'm I want to know more about your journey. I know you started writing this in 2002. Can you yeah. talk about your journey to write this this novel and how it changed over time? How the story changed? Yeah. Um... It was um, really the spring of 2002 that I started writing the book, six months after 9-11. My family observes the Passover tradition. A lot of families observe the Easter tradition uh, right around then. But uh, so it was an unsettled time. Uh, The city was still very much reeling from those attacks and everybody I think in the United States was affected in some way, but especially those of us who were within range of actually seeing the smoke coming from the wreckage and actually seeing bits of paper uh, in our our backyard. Um, And part of our family tradition, along with the the lighting of the candles and uh, the uh, pouring of the wine and the the, uh, hiding of the matzah and asking the four questions, um, is at the end of the meal, the Ten Commandments comes on television. And usually I only catch the very end of the movie with the parting of the Red Sea sequence. Um, but that year, because everybody was a little unsettled, I caught the beginning for the first time. And the credits roll, and there's Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner and Yvonne De Carlo. And it says, as the Pharaoh's army, the Egyptian Cavalry Corps. And that's when the light bulb went off for me. I thought, Cecil B. DeMille shot part of this movie in Egypt. And I knew enough to know that that was in a crucial period in the formation of the violent ideology that led to 9-11. I knew that was when Egypt's military was fighting against the Muslim Brotherhood, which wanted to turn the country into a theocracy right at that moment. And I knew some of this because my wife, Peg Tyre, had uh, co-authored a book called Two Seconds Under the World about the first World Trade Center bombing in 1993, and we'd actually met a couple of terrorists who were involved in that. And I thought, wow, Cecil B. DeMille somehow convinced the Egyptians to give him 200 cavalry officers to play the Pharaoh's army. As I read into it, I discovered that he got them to give him 20 Air Force planes to act as the wind machines in the desert. I discovered that he got access to the pyramids and all the major historical sites. And I thought, if I can't get a book out of this, I'm in the wrong business. So I thought it would be a cinch to turn it around quickly. Then it took six trips to Egypt and 20 years of different characters being at the forefront of the narrative before I found uh, the version that you just heard of a dialogue, a epistolary novel between the grandson and the grandfather. And, And that was crucial because history is interesting, but in a novel, there has to be some emotional punch. There has to be some emotional hook. Otherwise, why why would anybody care? I mean, it's interesting to know what wallpaper was on the wall in, in 1954, but that's not the story. That's not the emotion. That's not the human characters. So that's really the journey uh, that I needed to get to the end of, finding out whose story this was going to be. Well, yeah, um, yeah. I didn't know any of that. You, you know, you watch the film, and you know, many of us maybe a long time ago haven't seen it in a while. But you don't think about what was going on with the politics of that of that time. And so, I, I, I find it very fascinating that you went, you know, went deep into that and found out just how uh, relevant that history is, and 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 maybe some of the things you you wouldn't realize are going on behind the scenes. Well, it was all very resonant to me when I stopped and thought about it. The story of Moses is the ultimate liberation story, right? I mean, it's been around for 2,500 years. It's in the Old Testament. It's referred to in the New Testament. It's referred to even in the Quran. I've, you know, recently been reminded that was crucial as a part of the civil rights struggle in the United States that Martin Luther King talked about, you know, Moses and 
getting to the top of the mountain and, and not being able to make it to the promised land, but knowing it was out there. So here you have a movie about that moment of liberation going on at a time when Egypt itself had just gotten rid of the king. King Farouk had just been deposed. So they're struggling for a kind of liberation. Yet the United States has its own struggles for liberation. And it's not linear. It's not easy. It's not always a story of joy and triumph, or if you're being honest about it in some way. And so that's why I stuck with it through 20 years and many, many dead ends and rejection, frankly, from every publisher in New York City uh, and that I stuck with it and eventually found a, a publisher who was willing to do it. Uh, I went into television. I wrote four other novels while I was doing it. Uh, but I just believed in this story so strongly that I couldn't let it go. I think that that's great. That's something all authors go through is that rejection process and trying to decide, is this worth continuing yeah. on, on or not? Yeah. Peter, we are getting a bit of an echo from you. I'm not sure if it's the room or if there, maybe you might have another tab open or something, but it is a bit of an echo that wasn't okay. there when you first started. Um, I've it's been, the rockabilly influence. Okay. Uh, I've been texting with Bryn and it just doesn't seem to be working for her. So that's unfortunate. Um, I, I connected with her maybe six or eight months ago about having her on. And I was, I know she worked really hard on her, on her novel. Um, so let me go ahead and just read the, read the synopsis of Jaguars and other game. Um, so this is 1808 Rio de Janeiro. The Portuguese court flees Napoleon to Brazil for the first time and only time in history, a European royal family transfers its capital to an American colony. Maria Azevedo and her sister Isabel have spent years transporting gold through the jungle to Rio's port. They can dispatch jaguars and smugglers with a, a crack of a whip, but the Prince Regent's efforts to civilize the city have them looking over their shoulders. More soldiers, new laws, full stocks. Then the sister's childhood friend is wrongly imprisoned for murder. Maria knows the only hope a Brazilian has for justice in the court's Rio is if someone drops the real murderer on the palace steps. The sisters recruit Victoria Cruz, a Portuguese refugee, in service to Mad Queen Maria, and together they begin hunting a murderer through a city teeming with corruption. The women soon discover a conspiracy that reaches the heart of the Portuguese court, to save their friend from execution, they'll have to decide what they're willing to risk for justice, love, and family. So it sounds like a really exciting novel. Um, it brings up some history that I knew nothing about, the Portuguese royal family fleeing to, to Brazil. And Peter, as you brought up, um, you can't just have that history. You have to bring some emotion and some energy into it, some excitement. So it sounds like there's a, a, a murder plot in there as well. Uh, Gabriella, let's go back to you. Um, I wonder if you can tell us about um, your interest just in the genre of historical fiction, because I know your bio says you're interested in it at a very early age. Um, so what led you down that path um, to this yeah. genre? Well, uh, definitely started in school, uh, just with lo a love of history and literature that was very strongly encouraged uh, by my family, specifically my grandfather, uh, my parents, uh, my mom would just, you know, read to me every single night before bed. And my dad would tell me stories. My grandfather just loved history, loved literature. And he would, um, you know, just give me all these old movies to watch and my grandmother too, you know, pretty much everyone in my family was very supportive and just very interested in, uh, just learning in general. So it was just very much a passion for learning and for understanding, and uh, so as a kid, I loved those classes the most, history and literature, and I loved to read. I just loved, loved, loved to read. And so I would read anything I could get my hands on, um, but especially historical fiction. And so that just kind of sparked that interest in just learning about anything and about history. And it kind of brought the history alive because it's not a textbook. So there's one thing to read a textbook and to find it interesting. But as we said, there needs to be that emotional pull. And that's what I found in historical fiction, just that thing I could relate to, those characters I could be interested in. And so that's really what made me feel very connected to the events, more so than just learning about them. Um, 
so it's just something I never really got rid of. I just loved it so much. And when I got interested in writing again from a very young age, just because I loved history and literature so much, I tried to write. Um, historical fiction was always where I wanted to be in terms of my writing, but I was really afraid of it for a long time because I knew it required a lot of research. So initially I didn't try it. I thought I would just write some other things, see what else I could do. And, you know, of course, every genre has its own challenges, but just the research seemed so formidable to me. So I was just kind of afraid to do that. But then I realized if that's where I want my career to be, if that's where my passion truly lies, I need to just go for it. And if it doesn't work out, at least I tried it. Uh, so that's kind of where my trajectory uh, took me. Uh, and I just, it's just, you get to learn, you get to keep learning. And I love that so much about it. I love finding these little nuggets of history that I don't know much about, maybe other people don't know much about and uh, breathing life into them and giving them a real beating heart and just something that my readers can connect to and hopefully inspire them to go uh, turn to the actual events and the actual history uh, to learn even more. Yeah, I completely agree with just having historical fiction to inspire more learning, not just what you learn from the novel itself, but but to go in and look deeper into it. Um, can you remember off the top of your head any of those historical fiction books that you picked up and read and got, really got you started? Oh, absolutely. Uh, of course, all the classics. I loved classic literature. Uh, Jane Austen, uh, Louisa May Alcott, uh, Little Women, uh, or uh, Little House on the Prairie, all those stories. Uh, the first real historical uh, written in more modern time that I remember was uh, Number of the Stars by Lois Lowry, um, which was a World War II story about uh, a Christian family and a Jewish family, and uh, the Christian family is in the resistance, and the Jewish family is trying to flee, um, so they're working together to uh, save this, this little girl's best friend. Um, so that was the first story I remember set during the Second World War, but um, yeah, just so many others uh, I could probably sit here and tell you a bunch of titles, but uh, that's the one I first remember uh, just kind of really striking me uh, in terms of World War II and the things I write currently. You must have a, a good bookshelf of, of books. I do. Yes, I try. I try to keep it uh, nice and full. <laughs> uh, well, Peter, let's go back to you. I want to um, get back into your characters a little bit. So you, you started off with that um, letter, the email from Ali to his grandson, Alex. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit more about their relationship and why the grandfather decides it's so important to tell this history, to tell his story to his grandson? Yeah, um, I actually skipped ahead. The prologue actually begins with uh, a letter from the grandson to his mother on uh, the eve of him supposed to be going to uh, college for the first time. And he says, I'm not doing it. Uh, I know that you've raised me to be this respectful, obedient kid. I know that you've raised me to believe in the American dream. Uh, there's been an incident with his family, with his father being uh, falsely, wrongly arrested because he has the same name as a terrorist. And he um, has turned against the American dream that his grandfather has embraced so enthusiastically for the last uh, 40 years. And as the grandfather says in that little piece that I read, the kid has disappeared. He's not answering any letters, phone calls, or emails from any other member of the family. And so the grandfather is offering his own history. And during the course of the story, we learn how he went from being a movie fan to getting sucked into a Muslim brother conspiracy and then ultimately takes a different direction from that. And he offers that as a kind of cautionary tale uh, for his grandson. And then the grandson appears throughout the narrative to comment on this, uh, to say, who is this Charlton Heston that you're talking about? At? And how could you have allowed yourself to take part in this blasphemous movie? And, and so there's a, both a certain um, sinister element because the grandson is involved in this horrible contemporary a uh, 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 terrorist organization, but also there's meant to be some comedy in it uh, uh, because it's Hollywood and there's a certain campiness to it. And the movie actually has moments that you can't, the Ten Commandments I'm talking about, where it's not clear whether the, it's supposed to be funny or not. I mean, there's some really 
uh, hilarious stuff in it, frankly, uh, as well. So, so the novel is meant to be fun as well as being a, a commentary on uh, the past and present. And through um, these letters, the novel is also about storytelling itself because the grandfather hopes imparting this narrative will change the trajectory that his grandson is on. And, and it does, but perhaps not in ways that are predictable at all. So um, that, that was another important element that I wanted to weave in all the way through. Um, I wanna ask about, so Alex joins, he, you know, he, he, he goes to the Middle East and joins ISIS and that was, you know, a common at the time you started writing this novel in the in the wake of 9-11. Do you think that's still an issue today? And maybe what what is uh, the bigger threat now that we are, you know, 22 years beyond 9-11 to young, impressionable American youth? Well, actually, what ISIS wasn't around uh, when I started writing the book at all. Like, history caught up with me and passed me at the time I was writing uh, the novel. I, at various times, I thought the novel would have a different emphasis. In fact, um, I was in Egypt for a month during the Arab Spring and the Revolutionary Period, and I thought that would be the frame for the book, this moment of liberation for the Egyptian people when they finally got rid of you know, uh, the dictator, Mubarak who'd been ruling them for nearly 30 years. Somehow, as I was writing it, it didn't keep together. And now there's a reason why. Um, and um, the book needed to find itself in some way. I needed to let history catch up to me and, and feel its way into the story in a way that felt natural and organic. So we started with 9-11. We started with the resonance with what happened back in 1954. We had the more modern version of the hopeful moment in 2011. And then ultimately we ended up where we are right now. And, and in the end, that, that's the way it was supposed to be. There were no shortcuts. The only way to the goal was through, not around. Um, I see we do have a question for you, Peter. So I'm going to go ahead and go to that right away. If anyone else has any other questions, feel free to use that Q&A feature there and post your question. But uh, Alita asks, um, she read uh, a review about some brutal violent scenes in the book. Uh, how graphic are they and how, how many, you know, how prevalent is it in the novel? I don't think it's prevalent in the novel at all. There is, I, I won't lie. One scene late in the book, um, and I really, it's based on something that really happened. Um, and I really felt that I needed to be true um, to the history of what happened, just to give you a little bit of a clue uh, as to what I'm talking about. Not to be, I talk about the violence, but more the context of it. What happened during the filming of the Ten Commandments is Gamal Abdel Nasser who was the head of Egypt at the time, he was a lieutenant colonel in the army, was, uh, as I mentioned, um, trying to keep the Muslim Brotherhood from turning the country into a theocracy. They tried to assassinate him during this period, and he arrested many of them, along with members of an Israeli spy ring that was operating in the country at the time. So there was a massive crackdown and some of the characters in the book are caught up in this crackdown. And the true historic part of this is that these people who were natural enemies on the outside, the, the Islamic fundamentalists and the Israeli spies wound up in prison at the same time. And there was a moment, and this really did happen, where um, the guards said to um, the Islamists, we want you to confess your crimes. And if you don't confess your crimes, we are going to have this Jewish prisoner beat you. And the Jewish prisoner said, I'm not going to do it. And so in turn, they said, if you don't do it, we're going to beat you. And the Jewish prisoner said, I don't care. 
I, I won't succumb. And so that actually happened. So that is one of the violent scenes that you're referring to in the book. Again, I, I didn't see any way around it. Uh, I'm, I don't believe in violence for violence sake. I don't believe in darkness for darkness sake. But sometimes if it's really necessary to be true to the story, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That sounds like a very powerful scene and, and very important. Spoil, to spoiler alert. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, unfortunately, Bryn, um, as she texted me, she's like, I can't, I just can't get on. So that's <laughs> too bad. Um, technical difficulties happen. But I encourage all of you to check out her book. Like I said, go to that, get your book, and you can find all three uh, books by these authors. Um, but uh, yeah, go check out Jaguars, another game by Bryn Barno. Uh, Gabriella, let's go back to you. So we've been talking uh, to Peter a lot about... Um, tying the history to today. Um, and now yours takes place in, in Russia and it, it covers some very important history with the Russian revolution and then the Nazi occupation of Russia. Um, and now of course today, Russian events in that part of the world are as, as relevant to as ever. Um, can you draw any connections between what, what happened in, in your novel and, and how it's important for us to be able to maybe see that context for where we're at now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, so important to look at the history and see, as you said, the context and just kind of that evolution of the people who have been in power and the things that have happened and how they've affected the country. Uh, because at the time of, you know, the fall of uh, the Romanov family and the uh, imperial government, everyone, the lower classes especially, uh, were just so hopeful. And they wanted a government that they felt would represent them and their best interests. And so people really believed that. And they really believed that that's what they were fighting for. And they were fighting for that. But then the catch is you get certain people in power that just take over and don't necessarily uh, implement the plan that the vast majority uh, was hoping for. And um, so a lot of that is kind of what my characters are grappling with. My character is in a party that is trying to essentially get representation for all. That is not the goal of every single party involved. And so her goal is to uh, have her party succeed. And so that way everyone can have a voice and they won't be suffering under this dictatorship uh, that they have been in a sense from uh, the reign of the czar. Um, as we know, Russian history does not necessarily take the course that she was hoping for because there is a dictatorship that comes to power. And even though the USSR then falls, you know, many years later, we've seen that kind of repetition of dictators, not just in Russia, but, you know, all over the world. We see what happens and what they do and uh, the ways people suffer underneath them. So I think it's very important to uh, look at that. It's not always black and white and cut and dry. And, you know, the people living under these regimes are suffering, you know, and are hopefully trying to look to history also to learn, but then we know that, you know, it's complicated. And so it's difficult to point fingers or to say this, that, or the other about anything uh, going on. But of course we can look at those dictatorships and realize that's wrong and do our best to fight those as we are seeing today. And as we see through history, there are good people trying to fight for what's right and fight for the people to have a voice and to have the representation that they deserve and the kind of government that they deserve or that they hope for. And so I really want this novel to even though that there is an overarching theme of these politics going on, I didn't want to get too heavily into that because I want it to be very much about these people and these women and uh, especially this familial tie. I love, Peter, that we both have grandparents and grandchildren uh, in our stories. I think that's such a special bond and such a unique bond, especially as our characters are. They're two very different uh, grandparents and grandchildren involved. And so it's one seeing the course of their life and the things that they've done and the things that they've witnessed and trying to impart that wisdom onto the grandchild who maybe has a different idea, maybe has gone a different way and is trying to make his or her own way in the world for what they think is right. But uh, so it's very much that, you know, push and pull 
of these families and of these experiences that are complex and complicated. And I think the more we try to learn about them and try to understand them, the more we can look at what's happening today in an effort to understand how we've gotten to this point and how we can hopefully uh, prevent these kinds of things in the future. Yeah, well said. And I, I think those familial ties help humanize the history. Definitely. And like you said, it is complex and complicated. Well, we've been talking about some pretty heavy topics, um, so let's lighten it up a little. Gabrielle, if you could just continue, um, and I'll, Peter, I'll ask you too, but what, what are some of the, the joy that you get from writing historical fiction, from creating characters, from creating worlds, um, and even from bringing your book out into the world? Um, what have been some of the rewarding elements of that journey? Oh, gosh, it's been fantastic. Uh, just first of all, just writing the novel itself, even though there, these stories are set in difficult, complicated times. History is not, you know, sunshine and rainbows. Uh, so we do have to dig into those heavier subjects. And, you know, like Peter, I don't want to put violence in for violence's sake. I want to keep to the history and stay true to it without sugarcoating. But uh, part of that is finding a balance. Uh, so within the story, I do try to make characters that are very relatable, throw some humor in there. And in A Daughter's of Victory, just, I love the dynamic between uh, Svetlana and her granddaughter Mila. They are just two hard headed women who are constantly clashing and just arguing and just, but then at the same time, so supportive and, you know, caring for each other. And so that's the evolution of that relationship was a lot of fun for me. Um, so just that, creating these people that become your friends, your family uh, within the book. We get to know our characters so well. They just are little pieces of us uh, by the end. Um, and then just readers, having my book out there, knowing it's going to find somebody who's hopefully going to learn something from it or be touched by it. And uh, seeing those reviews or having people reach out to me directly and tell me they read my book or, you know, this resonated with them or they recommended it to a friend or, you know, just whatever the case may be. It just really does means so much and is so fulfilling and so rewarding and uh, reminds me why I love this job because I want to help people get through, you know, what they're going through in life or help, you know, take them out of what's happening and just escape for a little while and connect to people in my stories and my characters. And like I said, hopefully learn something not only about the book and about the history, but about humanity as a whole. And so it's just the most rewarding thing. And I cannot believe I get to call it work. <laughs> Nice. Well, um, Peter, I know you can probably relate to a lot of things Gabriella said, but um, what what can you add about what you've enjoyed about the whole process and, and where you, where it's gotten you now? Oh. Uh, what Gabriella just said, that after 20 years, just seeing the book between two covers, hearing from people who've actually read it and hearing that it landed at least for some people and or in some cases hearing their interpretation unless they don't like it in which case forget about it um but but just knowing that you've communicated from the studio in your mind to the theater in somebody else's mind that's that's the ultimate reward the additional reward is that unlike um a lot of historic uh, fiction i picked a period that's still within living memory or at least it was when i started writing the book so in the course of my research, I actually met some of the people who were involved in these events. Um, I, I talked to um, the brother of the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. I talked to people who were involved in uh, Nasser's government. And also I talked to quite a few people who were involved in the production of the Ten Commandments, including Nina Foch, who played Moses' mother. I spoke very, very briefly to Charlton Heston's son, who plays baby Moses in the film. But the most valuable resource um, I, was that I, I um, got to know the grandchildren of Cecil B. DeMille who were actually present and who were there in Egypt at the time, um, including uh, Cecilia Presley DeMille, who is um, Cecil B. DeMille's granddaughter, uh, who was 17. And so she was a witness not only to the Hollywood part of the story, but also very much the Egyptian part of the story because she lived there for quite some time afterwards. And so I sent her uh, the book and um, I was very interested in her response because I'm pretty tough on her grandfather in the book because he could be a pretty tough guy. He had a lot of responsibility. There were 15,000 extras in just one scene in the Ten Commands. 
So I was very gratified, and I'm quoting her, that she said that she loved the book because she would know if I got it wrong. I mean, I'm not saying I got everything right in the book, but to hear from somebody who would really have a stake in it and really a reason to be critical about it, that I passed muster with her, that was very, very meaningful for me. And, and I know you, you did a lot of travel. Um, was that enjoyable for you? Uh, yeah, um, all kinds of crazy, wild things happened. Um, at one point, I went to Mount Sinai, where they filmed some of the scenes in the Ten Commandments. There's a monastery there, St. Catherine's, which is, I believe, the oldest monastery in the world, or one of the oldest. And there are some very, very uh, elderly monks there. And I thought I might get lucky and find one who had been there in 1954. Remember, I, I started researching this book in 2002, so this is 20 years ago. And there was one particular monk that I found standing outside the gates. And uh, first I had to ascertain that he spoke English, and, and, and he did. And so I tried to impart to him this very foreign concept that I was writing a book about a movie that took place there. I, I said, this, this was a motion picture that was shot you know, many years ago. He goes, oh, the Ten Commandments, I have the DVD. I was like, really? <laughs> he says, uh, yeah, but I wasn't here uh, at the time. Uh, you know. And so we talked about religion for a while and I started to walk away and he said, um, where do you live? I said, uh, father, I, I live in New York City. He said, are you familiar with Nat Sherman tobacconists? I said, it's a, it's a tobacco shop on 42nd Street. He said, yeah. He said, if I give you a little money, can you get me a tin of Captain Black tobacco and send it to me at the monastery here? But you got to do it under a fake name, you know, because the, the head of the monastery, he's going to frown on this kind of thing. So there was stuff like that that happened all the time. I could fill another book with just stories of how I wrote this book. That's pretty funny. Yeah. Well, we just have a few more minutes. Um... I have two more questions I want to ask each of you real quickly. Um, so the first one, and uh, um, Gabriella, let's go to you. What are you working on now? What will we see next from you? So I am working on another historical novel. It's a bit of a departure from my first two. Uh, this one is inspired by my family history. Uh, so my grandparents are both or were both first generation Lebanese Americans who lived in the Deep South. Um, so it's a post-World War II story uh, inspired uh, really by their lives. I actually have uh, the letters that my grandparents exchanged in 1946 during their courtship. Uh, so I drew a lot from that and uh, I'm developing this novel about uh, two different Lebanese American women who are sisters-in-law uh, living in the Deep South. And it's just a lot of good family drama, family fun. Um, but definitely a little bit different and challenging in its own way uh, compared to these stories set in the heart of the war and things like that, because this one covers from about 1946 to early 1960s. So it's a different period for me, different type of novel, but uh, very personal, very close to home. Um, so I very much enjoyed uh, working on it. And uh, I don't have any information in terms of if it'll end up on a shelf anywhere yet, but uh, I've had a good time uh, working on it so far. So hopefully, hopefully I'll have news for you eventually. Thanks. Well, we'll definitely look forward to that. Peter, how about you? You must. Have, I'm guessing you have multiple projects. Yes, I uh, do. I um, am working on another contemporary urban crime novel, uh, which is again, you know, where I've spent a lot of my career. I usually do a lot of firsthand research when I write those novels. Uh, like the first book I wrote, Slow Motion Ride, is about a probation officer. So I spent six months being a volunteer probation officer, so I could have that experience. So I'm doing another one of those, but. Having had the experience of writing Picture in the Sand and writing a historical novel, I'm definitely going to do that again. Um, I just hope it won't take 20 years this next time. But I take solace in the fact that Moses spent 40 years in the desert. So listen, I only spent half as long writing this book, so that ain't so bad. That's a good point. Well, I always uh, end asking about uh, the value of historical fiction. I know we've kind of covered that a lot already, but this this press is called History Through Fiction, and um, that's all we publish because I think it is so important. Uh, so, Peter, uh, what you know? Why historical fiction? Why do you think it is valuable um, to share stories that way? 
just to, to have some sense of continuity in the human experience. If you, uh, you know, the first literature I fell in love with were the Greek myths. And uh, when you go back and you read Homer or you read um, some of the interpretations uh, that were done by Edith Hamilton uh, and Robert Graves, their uh, stories about um, jealousy and magic uh, and lust and pettiness, but, but you can recognize these as emotions that we still have now. And, and it gives you a sense of how we stand in the continuum of time and of what our own importance is or, or insignificance is, but also there's some comfort that we're part of the longer story. Yeah, well said. Uh, Gabriella, how about you? What, why, why historical fiction? To that same point, uh, definitely just, I love turning to historical fiction as a reminder that humanity spanning the decades is not that different. People who lived hundreds of years ago still face the same struggles, the same triumphs emotionally, physically, you know, intellectually that, you know, people today do. So I think it's a good reminder of that, a reminder that these times that seemed so far removed not aren't necessarily, uh, even if they are in terms of years, in terms of the human experience, the core of humanity and of life and of you know morality and justice and all these other things has always been there and will continue to be there for dozens, if not hundreds or thousands more years. And so I think turning to that is a good reminder uh, uh, to be empathetic and sympathetic and to learn and to understand and attempt to understand as best you can uh, so you can then be a better person, a better human, a better, better member of society and a family and of this world for whatever time you have on it. Yes, definitely. And it, it kind of makes me wonder what will the historical fiction look like 100 years from now when they're writing about right. this time period. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you. Thank everyone for joining me. Thank my panelists, Gabriella and Peter, and of course, Bryn, who unfortunately, because of technical difficulties, couldn't get on. Um, for those attending, send her a message, uh, tag her on Instagram or something. Say, hey, sorry, we missed you. Um, but let her just let, I, I'm sure she feels bad. I feel bad that she couldn't get on. So that's unfortunate. Um, if you want to pick up these books, remember there's that button at the bottom of the screen, get your book. Um, and that'll you know send you a landing page so you can pick up these books. Uh, thanks again, everyone. Um, I'm glad we were able to have this conversation. And congratulations, Gabriella and Peter, on your new novels. Thank you, thank Colin. You so and thanks for having us on. Yes, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Colin, for hosting. And 